Today we will tell you about uh, caching and varnish. I'm David Buchmann, I'm from Switzerland, working for a web agency there. And Ryobe is doing the second part, focusing on, varnish, on Easy Publish and caching specifically with Easy Publish. You're working for Netgen, don't know. Do you want to say something? Yeah, so, uh, my name is Heroy. Uh, I'm working for Netgen, and uh, I've been working with the PHP and Easy, Easy Platform for six years now. So, I'll try, just try to cover the, the, the aspect of using uh, the HTTP cache, uh, you know, from the Easy point of view. So, basically, the problem you want to solve is, is simple, right? Your site is like horribly slow. So, install Varnish on on the machine, have it cache things, and okay, good. So we're done, right? But what could go wrong? Lots of things can go wrong when you cache content. You could have nothing being cached. It's kind of the, the, the most common thing that happens. You put varnish there and it just doesn't make a difference. Um, what's even worse actually is when things get cached too much, like it, it doesn't update anymore, uh, the editors change pages and then they complain that they can't see the changes, or kind of the worst of things uh, when users see the content of other users because they get a cached version and it was personalized and things like that. So. Today, what we have on the menu is first, I want to give a quick refresher on HTTP itself, because the, like the whole topic of uh, HTTP caching is part of, of standards, and having an idea or having in memory how, how HTTP itself works should be really helpful for that. And then I'm gonna show how the standard of HTTP itself defines caching, how that works, how that's controlled. And we will do a couple of exercises with that, which basically we use PHP for the server side, but it could even be something else in PHP. It's really about HTTP in general. And then we're gonna see varnish, so the proxy cache itself, and then in the second part, we will see how Easy Publish uses Varnish, how Easy Publish does some of the advanced things that you can do with caching. So, HTTP. First off, let's like remember what the reverse proxy even is. So on this diagram, you basically you see we have the internet, and the reverse proxy is something that sits in front of your web server. So you have some web server with a easy publish application on it or other web applications. And instead of the internet connecting directly to that machine, you put something in front of it, which runs this uh, varnish server. And the varnish server takes every request, looks at it, and checks if it can serve that from the cache. And if not, it goes to the backend, so that would be the line above where it says cache miss, so it goes to the application server, tells it I need this, and the application re uh, responds. The cache looks at that and keeps it in case it's needed again. And the next time it's requested, the cache will realize, oh, I already have that, uh, and my cache is still valid. We will see later what valid means and return that, and then the expectation is that Varnish is really fast in doing those lookups, which it usually really is because it just stores all the data in memory. And so it's, it's just like some memory access and it returns the whole HTML thing without ever like re-rendering a page, without executing any, any code to generate the page. Uh, 
Um, who of you is familiar with this? Okay, so it's just to, to show you HTTP itself is not a, a mystery or something. In the end, it's, it's like a telnet connection. It's like a, a thing where you, send, where you send simple text instructions to the server and the server will reply. So the first line would be what the client sends and then the line three and on is what the server replies. You tell get, which is one of the methods like get and post, uh, what path, and then there can be headers, and then the server will reply with, uh, I'm doing HTTP here, and I give you a status, like 200, and also some headers, like the content type, and then the body. And when we talk about HTTP and about the caching, we only care about headers, we don't care about the actual body, really. That's, that's not something that the, the cache cares about. So we have these uh, verbs. I'm sure you have seen those in some way. So the basic idea is that you like tell what you actually want to do with a resource. The important thing in regards to caching is that usually uh, get and head are supposed to not change anything on the server. Like if you ever have a get request that has a, I don't know, query parameter that stores some value on the server, you're doing it like seriously wrong. Not only for caching, it's also a, a major security problem, but for caching it will totally not work that way. Because the Varnish, for example, and all the other caches will assume that a get request doesn't ever change anything on the server. On the other hand, if you do post, put, uh, delete when you do like um, APIs, you, you might use more than just post for the forms. All these methods, they are, they are expected to change state on the server, which means that you can't cache that. It, it doesn't make sense to cache the response to an, an operation that should change something because the change always has to go to the web application, otherwise things won't work. So in like, whatever, 99.99 .99 of the cases, you're gonna only cache get and head. Right, then the response codes, which identify if things worked or um, not. So there are all these three digits codes and the first digit gives kind of the group and you have the 200 something that say everything went fine, 300s that are redirects, 400s which is client errors. So you say like whatever you do this is not gonna work because you're doing it wrong client. And the 500s mean well it possibly could work later because it's not supposed to happen, it's, uh, it's a mistake by the server. And the the thing to note here is again, Varnish will only cache some of these states by default. Typically all the 500 states are not cached because it assumes, well, something went wrong on the server, we don't want to like replay that result, that's <coughs> probably not the intention. Uh, however, the, the, uh, like the 200 states, 200 like OK for example is cached, um, also permanent redirects or you can cache, for example, a 404, a not found response, depending on, on what you need, what you want. Um, some tools that we will use in the exercises. It's gonna be helpful to yeah, be aware how, like what, what's actually going on with a request when you have to debug something, when something is caching and you want to know why or why it's not caching. So with, uh, with um, Firefox, Chrome, you have the network tab that you can see and, and there you can click on the request and see all the headers and the response headers. And you also see if, if that was cached or not, you see the HTTP status. Uh, but what I 
mostly prefer when I'm like really checking what's going on with with headers is is these um, curl or w get, and with these options you don't see the payload at all, you just see the headers. And yeah, so you, you request the page and all you see is the headers and then you know what's going on. We will use these a lot later in the exercises. So far so good. Then cache control. There is two basic approaches that are defined in the HTTP specification and that are general caching concepts. One is the expiration model, and the other is the validation model. In a nutshell, expiration means you tell this cache is valid for X, five minutes, two hours, a year, whatever, but for some defined time. And during that time, um, the, the system that has a cached, has cached data knows it, it doesn't need to recheck that data, it's going to be valid. I just use it without even checking it. The other one is validation, where you give some sort of tag or uh, information on the, on, on the response and say this response has this like, attributed tag and then later on when, you, when the client, the consumer needs it again, it can check with the server and say, is this still valid, is it still okay? And if it is, you don't need to retransmit all the data and possibly you can also do this validation check without rebuilding the whole page. So that's still a speed up, it's, it's kind of the more conservative, the more safe way because you always have the chance to update the content with the expiration model. Once you send out your page, with, it's valid for a year Clients that implement the cache and everything, they won't request your thing again for a year, so you can't really update it anymore. So expiration is usually done with this cache control header where you specify smaxh or maxh. I'm gonna say like in a minute what that means. And the, the other one expires is more like kind of a historical thing. The problem with that is mainly clock skews. So if um, theoretically all the clocks would be on the same time, but practically they might be not. And then when you expire with an with a absolute date or time or whatever, things can get messed up. However, if you just specify it's going to be valid for X, minutes, everything should work even, even if clocks are off. Um, so smaxh is uh, information specifically for caches. The S stands for shared. So it's the max age that a shared cache may, may keep this uh, content. And then max age specifies how long the client should keep the content. And all of these numbers is in seconds. And the list here below is what Varnish looks at. So first thing it checks, is there an smaxh specified? For example, here we would tell Varnish to cache for one hour. 3,600 seconds, and we would tell the client to cache for 900 seconds, so 15 minutes. Now, if the S max age is not present, Varnish will continue, it will look at the max age and say, well, if you have only a max age, I'm gonna use that. Um, if no cache control header is present at all, it's gonna look at expires. But as said, I would recommend not to ever use that header. And in the end, if the response is cacheable, so it has a, a status that allows it to be cached, it was a get or a head request, then, and, and there is no caching information at all, it's gonna use a, a default value, which the, well, the default for that default value is two minutes. 
So if you have like nothing, Varnish is going to cache for two minutes. And if your application sends a lot of responses without caching information and you want a different default, you can change that to something else. Now let's get ready for the first exercise. Um, please boot up your virtual box if you didn't already and go to this easy varnish folder and git pull to get the very latest versions of, of the code. And then you run this enable varnish line. It's not strictly necessary, uh, well, actually it is, because it will, um, for one thing, it will put varnish on port 80, so that when you go with the browser, you go to your page through varnish. And the other thing is it symlinks the VCL files in so the, the varnish configuration files uh, to to the files in the in in this uh, repository so that you have the correct configuration um does that work for everybody? Somebody still waiting for the machine to boot or? No, okay. Um, just tell me if I need to get back so, so that you can find the things. Um, so the first exercise uh, would be to, to do expiration. So first thing you would request, like after, after running this uh, enable varnish thing, you request the no info and see what happens. And then you edit the file. So um, that file would be in here in web exercises, expiration, and then in the file, Um, we're supposed to to output something to make it cache. Um, I didn't mention it on the slides. What you, what you will need is uh, the header function of PHP. And The, the way this works, you, you just specify the name of the header, header, so probably cache control, and then colon, and then the values. <coughs> and we want to cache for 10 seconds so that when you, um, sorry, when you, when you run this line, you would see that it's cached, and then if you wait for 10 seconds and request again, you would get a fresh version. Um, so basically what you would do is specify a max age of 10, a shared max age. And now if we run this, um, you see that that something custom varnish, we made varnish output this uh, header to know was it a cache hit or miss. And we also make it uh, add the age of the cache in a header in the response so that we see how old, how old that is so that we, we can debug what's going on. So if I request it, I guess that was more than 10 seconds. Yep, it's a miss again. If I request it faster, we, we see how the age is increasing. Nine, 10, bam, and gone. And if you request <coughs> the no info, we will see how the age will climb up and we see the TTL that we also output, which is at uh, two minutes. So it's the default value because no info really has no info at all. Whoops, where is it? Uh, it just 
outputs the, the current timestamp without any headers. So far, so good. Shall we move on? Everybody fine with that? Yes, no, maybe? Move on? Good. Um, so the next thing we want to try out is cache validation. For cache validation, there is uh, kind of two, two different modes. One is the e-tag, and e-tag is kind of, uh, uh, so from the specification point of view, it has no semantic meaning. The, the, the value of the e-tag is just something, and when you later request the same content, you can say, you can send, like the client can send this if non-match with the e-tag and say, I want this content, but I only need it if it's different. It ha if it has a different e tag than this thing you gave me last time. And the the point is, the server knows how to calculate the e tag. Like maybe if you have uh, if you have some kind of CMS, then it could be some timestamp of when the page was last edited, or it could be a hash over all the content plus uh, templating plus I don't know what. And ideally it's something that is cheap to calculate because then the server could even just calculate the hash first and figure out, oh, actually it didn't change so I don't even need to render the page again. And if the hash matches, the server can reply with a 304 status and that status says, it didn't change, and it won't even send the the content again. So, on on larger document that also saves bandwidth in addition to saving capacity. So let's try that out. We have a an exercise for the e-tag. That file here. So, here we, we want to set an e-tag header. Oops. And then with this uh, minus h, we can tell curl to send along an additional header and make this e-tag check. So it's the, the header is really called like that. And by the way, all HTTP headers are case insensitive. So it doesn't matter if you write this uppercase, lowercase. The, the minus do matter, but upper lowercase is not relevant. Uh, no, it's, uh, I think spaces are not allowed in headers. That's why they use this hyphen separators sometimes. So here we would say e tag is ABC. Now um, so now if we if we request this with the if non match, we get this reply and if I change this to if non match A B C D we get a two hundred okay and and get the body. Uh, one thing to note is um you, you might have noticed that there was the first time we had a cache miss here. So Varnish is handling this. And to handle it, it will 
like if it has the information in cache, it can handle it itself. It just compares the cache. If the cache is still valid, it does the ETAG comparison. The kind of surprising bit maybe is that it will, if it doesn't have it in cache, it will do a full request to the backend and then attempt to cache the response. And you basically you can change all behavior of Varnish in, in its configuration. We will come to that later and if you have like a use case where you have things that are requested very like in, in uh, infrequently, like seldom requested, and you really want your backend to handle the if non match, you would have to change how Varnish uh, behaves. Because otherwise it's just trying to say, well, I care about this thing, so I'm, I'm getting it, and then I have it in cache, and then I can handle the if non match myself. Good. Then the other cache validation thing is the last modified. I think that was historically like the first uh, that was before the e tag thing. Um, it works very similar, except that it works with time. So you specify a time, and then uh, the if modified since compares if if the last modified is after the if modified since, and otherwise you you get the cached version. And this is again, it's, it's a bit more tricky because of the of the risk of clock skews. Also, it's kind of yeah. I, I don't know. I don't see what added value it would have over an e tag basically because an e tag is is just it, it matches or not. And with the in the end, with last modified and if modified since. You can't do anything more fancy than it matches or not. Uh, but let's still try that. Yep. There, so there is this uh, last modified thing. Um, yeah. Note. Note this uh, hint here. The the problem is that. Varnish really wants the uh, time stamp with a GMT time zone. I actually didn't validate if that's still true with Varnish 5, but possibly it is. And so, whoops, when we look here, and theoretically the plus zero zero would be the same time zone as GMT, but Varnish will only accept the timestamp if it's in GMT, so you have to use this uh, <coughs> this date formatting function. Otherwise, it's not gonna work as expected. Would be more correct is that this file standard requires date to be formatted like this, yeah. not Varnish actually. Okay. So I think like, it would be ideologically more correct. All right. <laughs> Okay, so Varnish is following the standard, yeah, saying is, it must be like that. Yeah. Of course, yes. So 
basically we just write this line header last modified and then append the date in, in this uh, correct formatting. And now if I request this, we see there is this uh, last modified header in it. And now if I send if modified since, I, yes, I get a 304 not modified. And so if I, if I like increase this by a few seconds, it will still say it's not modified because it like last time it was modified was uh, GMT eight uh, zero seven zero zero. Uh, one kind of interesting thing is if I say if it it's not modified since some time in the future, it's going to give me the response, and that's because the as soon as I say if modified since with a timestamp in the future. Um, the varnish or the standard says like something's like really weird here. You you are living in the future that doesn't work. So we have we are probably like off with our clocks, and then you again get the full response. Because that's kind of the nice thing with this caching. It if something doesn't make sense, it's always safe. From, from a semantical point of view to say yeah, you, you just get the response because that it, it works. It's not uh, like the caching is just a layer on top and it, it helps if it works out and if it doesn't work out, it's not a, it shouldn't be a problem. Um, yeah, as I said, I, I'd recommend to only use the e-tag and The thing is, if you use both last modified and an e-tag together in in your um, in your response, the client is supposed to also use both, and the standard says that only if both match, you will get the cached content. But it's kind of yeah, the, the only reason to use both would be to support uh, clients that only handle one or the other. Basically, if, if, you, if you do something for web browsers, like all web browsers support e since I don't know when, but long enough that almost everybody will profit from it. And if you do some application, then hopefully the clients that implement caching at all will implement e as well. Um, just a note on when you, when you play around or try out something with these caching, um, with, with cached contents. So a web browser, when you follow a link, uh, if the cache is not expired, so if max age and s max age, well, for the client it's just max age, if that's not um, expired, it won't send a request at all. It will just load things from its local cache which is kind of the desired effect usually because that's like the, the fastest you can have. There is no network overhead at all. But if you're like debugging and playing with the cache headers, then it could be surprising. Then the, the if it's expired, but there was an e-tag or last modified, if you follow the link, it's just gonna send the request with the if non match, if modified since headers. If you press the reload button or do a control R or command R in, in a web browser, it will ignore its local cache in the sense of it, it will ignore the max age, but it will still send the if modified, if non-match headers. 
So when you work with Varnish, it, it will still not download. It will just uh, send these uh, if headers. And if you want to be sure that you really sent the full request, then you can either you can like clear all browser cache or all cache for that page, or uh, the shift control. I don't know in <coughs> Mac if it's shift command uh, R to to like force reload the whole thing. And keep in mind that you can't tell all users of your website to ever do that. So if you use max age, be like conservative with your max ages. Then there is things that you don't want to cache at all. And to not cache, the kind of the, the most the thing that the standard would require is you, you can set the S max age to zero. You can declare it to private. That tells a, a uh, proxy cache in the middle of things. It shouldn't cache. Um, that becomes less and less relevant, but Varnish 3 is still sometimes around. And Varnish 3 only looked at S max age and not at the other headers. I don't know why. And in Varnish 4, they changed that to, to be, uh, I guess, like closer to the expectation. Again, this is default behavior. You can change that. You can tell your varnish to whatever, ignore the S max age or do other things. Um, let's quickly try out that one. Let's not cache a page. So we have this no cache file, which you should set a header so that when you request it repeatedly, it, it will always be a cache miss with this. Does that work for you? So yeah, what you do is, uh, whoops, cache control, s max h, whoops, must be zero. And now if we request this page, it will never be cached. And by the way, all these example files include the timestamp to the second as a, as a body. So when you request it, you also see if you got a, and a cached version, it means the timestamp doesn't update. And for this one, the timestamp will update each time that you request it. So yeah, we see a cache miss, the age is 0, 10, 16, 13, 10, 16, 21, uh, 25, 27, 9. So it's it's um, it's not caching at all. Um, and as a side note, if you if you want to know what varnish is uh, like, what the defaults are, there is this file, which is the. The, the varnish configuration and that defines the default behavior. So you can really look at that file and it tells you all of the default behavior varnish has and it also kind of gives you a hint how you can change that. I'm going to share the slides by the way so you, you can have access to the notes and links and all that. Um, yep, so Varnish and the, the HTTP caching specifications. We only cache get and head requests. Head, by the way, is a request saying I want all the headers for that page without the actual payload. 
it, it's the same as get, but without the body of the message. Um, then if there is a cookie, if there is a authorization header, Varnish by default won't ever cache anything, which is the safe default because it doesn't know what's going on. Like your server might use the cookie to change the response. And if that's the case, then you probably don't want to cache. You could theoretically have like a separate cache by cookie, but probably with cookies that's not gonna make any sense because then everybody has their own cache and then they can just as well use the browser cache. Like the point of, of a proxy cache only becomes relevant when you have several people requesting the same thing and getting the same reply. Otherwise, there is no value in, in a server-side caching. If a response has a set cookie header, it's also not going to be cached. That wouldn't make much sense because you set a cookie, you probably started a session or something. And there is this list of safe HTTP statuses, and those are the only ones that are cached by default. And you can change that, like in a project that we had, we decided we cache all the 500 errors for a few seconds as well, because they like, usually happened when the backend was overloaded, and we said, well, better like give some air to the back end in that situation and have a few people maybe get unnecessarily server errors, but the back end can recover rather than just keep hammering it. So all of this is default. Um, let's look at the cookie thing. So we have a We have one example here. You don't need to change the code. You just, we just request this, which has a, or which sets a cookie, rather. Um, so here, we have the header setting a cookie. And we don't, um, so we don't specify anything about uh, caching, what well, we even say, hey, you can cache this and whatever. And Varnish is not caching it. We always have cache misses because of this set cookie header. And similar, if we, if we send, oh, sorry, if we send a cookie, um, so to, to some, something that normally would be cached, uh, it won't it won't be cached. So here we have miss, miss, it, it keeps missing. And if I delete the part about the cookie, the first time it's still a miss, and now it's hits. Because Varnish, when it sees the cookie, it's really just sending through the request and getting the response. It's not doing anything with it. Now, another thing that is uh, sometimes relevant, depending on, on what you do, that's mainly a thing when you have HX calls or REST APIs that you cache, less so with a, with a CMS kind of things where you always have HTML variants. So, for example, we have a client that requests some resource and it can send you an accept header to tell what encoding it is happy with. So this one, the, the one client would say, hey, I'd like to have JSON. And then you have another one that says, hey, I'd like XML. And clearly those two things are not the same at all. Like if you would cache the first request, oh, resource is this JSON blob, and then the other one comes and requests XML, it would just get JSON. And in, in this scenario, you would even, it, it would be random, like whatever, whatever is the first request will, will fill the cache and then everybody gets the same encoding. And that's what the vary header is for. So the, the application can send vary and the, the payload of that header is 
the name of request headers. So here we say the response that you got here depends on this accept header. So whenever there is a different accept header, it will be a separate thing. It has to be cached separately. And yeah, that thing is called, the, the accept thing is called content negotiation because technically you can also, uh, you, you maybe you've seen that in web browsers, you can have like this, uh, I want this with a priority of whatever and I could also use the other encoding thing. But when you do REST APIs, you typically you just want one or the other format. So the idea here would be that you add the vary header to the content negotiation PHP file. And just gonna show you what happens if we don't do it. <coughs> um, yeah, so here I request that to have it in the cache and then I say I want JSON. And I just get the same thing from the cache. Which is obviously not JSON. So what we do here is we add vary and say it varies on the accept. And then the, the application is all there already. So basically we have a date and then we, we check if, like if the accept mentions application JSON. And if so, we send a reply with JSON. And of course, if you have your framework, your application, that's gonna look a bit different, hopefully. But, but here we just want to see the very basic principle. So now when I request this, I got back a JSON. So that would still, like that would have worked before, but now if I remove the accept header, we get the other thing and now we have a cache hit with this and we also have a cache hit with the JSON. Does that make sense? Good. Um, just a quick side note before we move on to varnish proper. Um, here we, we used the header function of PHP, but that was mainly to show you the idea to be, because it's like so simple that you can read the file and you just see exactly what's going on. If you use a easy publish, for example, then you don't want to use the header function. You want to set the information on the response object. It has like, uh, I, I think uh, you will show that later in detail, but you set that information. And there is some configuration on Easy Publish where you can tell it like, yeah, you can cache stuff. If you need more specific things, uh, there is a Symfony bundle called FOSS HTTP cache bundle, which I co-authored. And that allows you to, to specify such things like the, the headers in like in more detail and in a configuration file. So basically, you, you have a set of rules. You say, we match all the requests that go, for example, to a host, or basically anything that you can match a request on, like, uh, like the path, like the controller that is used for it. And then you specify a bunch of headers that you want. Um, Here's another one, 
it it even like it it does the the PHP time thing. So you could say last modified one hour ago if you just want a last modified header. Um, yeah, here we would say like if it goes to this controller, it's public. It has a max age and a shared max age. And this last modified. So this is just uh, a way to not have to, like yourself, set it on every response, but do it in a more generic, global way. I think the Easy Publish comes with the FOSS HTTP cache library, but it doesn't install the bundle by default. But you can just add it to the project if you, if this is useful for you. <coughs> Basically, basically, it does have a bundle, but it's not using most of its components. It's just using a cache manager, and that's it. Yeah. So the bundle is installed, B bundle but is it's installed. not. Yeah, it's in vendor folder, but uh, only the cache manager is being used for invalidation, and that's All right. about it. Yeah. So you can configure it, and then it will start doing yeah. things. Yeah, but technically speaking, if you have the custom uh, Symfony route or controller, you could use this cache, uh, cache manager configuration to configure it for that route. Mm -hmm. So nothing is stopping you to add, to add a custom role. Cool. Yeah. All right, um, still alive. So let's go to varnish proper after all this teasing and talking about HTTP while I, I promise to talk about varnish. Um, so I mentioned that in the beginning, varnish is this reverse proxy, so it's its own application, it's like its own thing. On the diagram, we had two servers that totally didn't look like servers look today, but whatever, it's actually, it's, it's a piece of software. It doesn't technically have to run on a different machine or whatever. It's, it's just another piece of software. It runs on, a, on an address, on a port, and handles things like here in the virtual box. It all runs inside the same virtual box. So it, it's just running somewhere and receiving the requests and it has to be configured to talk to backends when it needs the actual response if it doesn't have it in cache. You configure it with the Varnish configuration language. So that's a, a domain language for caching. It's, it's really made to, to change headers uh, of the request and the response and take decisions. The like varnish works as a state machine, and the, the, yeah, I guess like the whole thing is it, it wants to be highly parallel, so it can handle a lot of requests. So you don't it's it's not like PHP where you have like a thread or a process f per request, and you can have some kind of global state or whatever that doesn't exist in in varnish. In the VCL, you have requests and there is no variables even, not at all. And each state has a hook function. So in each state, there is some VCL function called by Varnish, and there you can do things. And then that configuration is um, compiled into machine code. So it's, it's like really highly efficient Varnish can also act as a load balancer, for example, so you can specify multiple backends, you can make it probe if the backend is still alive, you can, for example, even make it cache longer if a backend, like if all backends died and things like that. I'd say it's like the primary thing of Varnish is being a cache, so don't overdo it. At, at some point when you have like a lot of different backends and a lot of routing decisions, you're probably better off uh, using HA proxy or Nginx or something. I feel it's, it's like you can, you can use it for that. It, it can do it, but it's not the primary intention of it. So if you have like really a, a, a big system and a lot of routing, then maybe better use something that is dedicated for just that. Also, if you make your one varnish do like too many things at once, it, it might get overloaded. And then 
you can split it that way and say like all the routing stuff is one system and then each of the systems has a varnish instance that is only about the caching. So this is the state machine. And you have the request coming in. And the first hook function that is executed is this VCL receive. So this is executed and can look at the request. It can clean up the request if it wants to. And each of the hooks is supposed to return the um, like the transition that should happen now. So you don't have return variables, values, something like in PHP, you just return the decision uh, what transition to execute. And from receive, there is two options. You can say pass. Pass means this request, uh, maybe it's a post, maybe it's uh, like not even proper HTTP or something. We just send it to the back end and don't even try to do anything with it. Go to the back end with that and then we still get here this uh, back end response. So the information, we, we got something, <coughs> but it will be delivered directly. It can't go to the cache. And the other option is to say look up. That means we think this could be potentially cacheable. So we should go to the cache. And there is one kind of smaller thing, VCL hash, which takes the request and creates a hash key from that so that it can do uh, just a lookup in the cache. Do, do we have that hash or not? And usually the hash consists of the host, of the path, and I think that's it. So host and path, so if you have a different domain but the same URL, it shouldn't collide if you have the same domain but a different URL. And by, by URL, well, not path, it's the full URL, so like the, the query string parameters are also taken into account. And remember, if it's a post or something, it can't be cached anyway, so the, the a post body, a request body doesn't come into play at all. That, that wouldn't go to the cache, it's just passed through to the back end. And then with the hash, there is the lookup in the cache, and the decision, like, there might be something, and basically the cache lookup is checking, um, like, it, it's only returning you something if it's still valid, so if the, if the S max H has expired since, since it was last looked at, then the cache will say, oh, I, I don't have it. You don't get to decide on that level. And from the cache, you have these two options. It could be a miss. Then we have to go to the back end. So we have another, so we have this miss thing. And then we have the a handler that says, I'm now about to send a request to the back end. And then it goes to the back end and you get again to the backend response, and here you have the, the choice still to say, oh, well, this request looked like it could be cacheable, but actually the response is telling me it can't be cached for some reason. Like by default, the set cookie header, there is a set cookie on it, okay, that's not cacheable, we're not gonna cache it. If we can cache it, uh, the transition is called deliver, and then it goes into the cache. And then there is, like if it's, uh, if it's found in the cache, you get this VCL hit function, which is only executed if it was found in the cache and not, uh, not when, you, when you come through that path, which mainly I think is for debugging or you could remove some, some headers that you add when you put it in the cache. And then finally, the VCL deliver, that's executed always, regardless of what was happening. And typically it's a place to remove headers that you used to like manage the cache between 
the application and varnish. Uh, one word about variants. So when you have variants, you need to, like on the request, you don't know if there is a variant thing on, on the request. So uh, in this content negotiation example, the cache key um, would always be the same regardless of what my accept header is. And then in the cache, you find under that key, you find multiple responses and the vary information. So you, you have one request, one hash, and then you find like, oh, there is several responses for this one request, but they have this vary header, so I can like figure out which of the responses matches. Um, yeah, we're gonna look at the, the varnish configuration language now. Just be careful, it's, it's like um, really just doing what you tell it and you operate on a quite low level. You, you change headers of request and response. So it's, it's quite easy to do stupid things if you have cookies and you tell it like, yeah, you just cache this, I don't care. It's gonna do it and then, I don't know, maybe I log in into your page and I have a cookie, I have my credentials, I see my private stuff and it caches that and then somebody else comes and goes to the same URL and just gets the cached response. So, yeah, think about what you're doing and then test if it, it, if it really works like you expected. So what can VCL do? Um, as said, in the end, everything, like all output and input it has is the headers of the request and then the response. And it can read those values, it can write to headers, it can unset them. There is if conditions. So you can say if this header, like with a regular expression maybe, does it contain this? <coughs> Sorry. Um, but there is no loops, for example. It, it wouldn't really make sense to have loops, but it's, it's like really simplified to what you need. There is functions, you can define your own functions and call them, but a function can only ever read and write headers. It can initiate the state change, it can initiate the transition. Um, it can invalidate the cache, that's one other interaction it can do, but it can't, for example, return a value. It, it doesn't, that's not how it works. And as I said, you have no variables. So if you really need some information that is passed along, you can set it in a header. And that, it's, uh, um, it's not really a hack, it's, it's supposed to work like that. So you can set a special header in VCL receive and then use that later on. And then maybe in the VCL deliver, you, you might want to unset that header to not leak your internals to, to the outside. Um, kind of all that I said before is not really exactly true because you can specify inline C code if that feature is enabled in Varnish. I'd recommend to, to try to not have to do it because it's, then it's like even more low level, you do the pointers and things, but then you can just do anything that you can do in C which is really everything a computer can do. And there's also varnish modules, kind of plugins that add functionality, and those are implemented in that way. So if you have like a case that can't be handled and where you're sure that it's, it's really the right place to do it, then by all means do, do that in C code or bind some C library. Just be aware that's like used and, and uh, there in all the requests if you have memory leaks. It's a very bad place to have a memory leak. Oh well, you can do it. And the last thing, yeah, there is also like various, like all the typical ways to specify that something is a comment. <coughs> um, I mentioned before that Varnish compiles its configuration into binary code that also, it, it 
it doesn't like check the configuration file on each request. That would be kind of a waste of efficiency, a massive waste. So when you change the configuration, you you will have to reload the configuration. The easiest is you just restart Varnish, because then it will forget all of its cache, and it will recompile the configuration. And of course, if you if you would change the configuration, but something is still in cache, you might have unexpected behavior because you have kind of the old headers, the old information on the cached thing, and you have your new code. Um, nonetheless, there is uh, more, like, less drastic methods than restarting whole Varnish. Uh, there is a tool called Varnish Admin. Uh, it's a command line tool, and it allows you to do some uh, kind of calls. Uh, one of them is you, you just type vcl.load, and then it will recompile and reload the configuration without invalidating the cache. So if you're like debugging something, that could be handy. And the other, um, the other thing you can do is invalidate all the cached things. We'll come in more detail to that later, but you can just tell it, for example, here we ban everything where the host header, um, like this, tilde is a regular expression match, and dot in regular expression means anything. So basically you say, just forget about all of your cache. So this is what the VCL looks like. Looks kind of a bit like Java or C or something. Um, in this example, we we set the information if there was a cache hit or a cache miss, cache miss and we set the information uh, what the time to live of, uh, of this object is. So time to live in the cache. And uh, yeah, one thing that's a bit tricky when you're in these uh, VCL backend something, then the the variable to reference to the response will be bresp for backend response. And then when you're in deliver, you're kind of on the other, on, on the delivering side of things, then it's called resp. Don't ask me why. It's like that. The, so this, uh, this thing is just available in your, in your hook function, and it represents the response being sent. And then dot HTTP means we access the headers, and then you just write the name of the header. And you don't have to, I don't know, define a variable or something. You just say HTTP dot and then name of the header. And here you see that we have, um, we access the TTL field of the backend response directly to, to read that. And down here, we set a header that tells if, if we have a cache hit or miss. And for that, we read the thing called object. They love shortening things. Uh, it's the object. It's the cache object, that variable. And it has a field called hits, which tells how many times there was a cache hit with that object. And of course, uh, concurrency and whatever, I, I guess the exact number of hits would not necessarily be accurate in concurrency, but it, it doesn't really matter. We just want to know if it's bigger than zero. It means there was a cache hit because our own hit is counted with that. And well, I mean, I'm not gonna give you like a reference of all the all the fields and things that you can do. There is uh, extensive documentation on that, and. Honestly, like most of the time I interacted with Varnish in the end, it was kind of looking for recipes in the, in the documentation. They have a lot of recipes for standard use cases. And very often you don't need more than, than those. So this one is, uh, 
no, not load balancing, but uh, kind of routing thing which you can do. Um, what we do is we define two backends, one that we call default, one that we call legacy. We specify, um, that example is a bit funny, uh, we specify the IPs and the port, and obviously that would need to be different because that makes no sense at all like this. Um, imagine that this is a different IP, so we have two backends and one part needs to go to a different backend. In the receive function, we can choose which backend to use by setting the backend hint property on the request object. So here we look at the request URL and have a regular expression match saying it must start with slash archive slash. And if it does, we want to go to the legacy backend. And in all other cases, let's go to the default. That This is kind of redundant because the default is used by default. But yeah, that way you can specify the backend you could also, like whatever, if you have more complicated things, you can update that value multiple times and it just overwrites and the last one is used. Then you can remove headers. This is kind of a, a bad example because you, we, we say if the request is for anything in the cache path, we don't want cookies so that we can have caching. Uh, if we would put this uh, into the configuration and then do a request with a cookie, we would still get a cache hit because the check if the request has a cookie happens after this VCL receive is executed. But the problem with this is that here we, we have some sort of application knowledge in Varnish which is like mixing the two things up. Um, there is, a, in the documentation, there is like this monster blob of a thing that you can do to like strip all the cookies except the session cookie, which is something that makes a lot of sense because you, you will want the PHP session cookie. If it is there, you probably want to keep that. But if there is just other cookies, like uh, whatever Google Analytics is just vomiting cookies into your, into your system, into, into the browser, browser is sending those to the server, and that would destroy all caching, basically, because you always have cookies if you use Google Analytics in the site. But actually, that cookie is not needed on the server. And there, in my opinion, it's the correct thing to say, we only preserve the cookies that the server cares about and everything else is removed in Varnish because that will also prevent you from having, like if you say, well, if there is cookies, we still cache, then it's dangerous because if suddenly the, the server, the backend would use the cookie to change the content, you have the problems. If the cookie is not there, like the worst that will happen is that the whatever the developer that had no idea what he was doing is realizing that it doesn't work now, but you don't get a, a cache mix up. And I'd rather have something not working than exposing private information. So with VCL, yeah, you can change uh, headers, add headers, remove the headers and do decisions on when and how long you want to cache. You can also change the, the request URL, for example. Um, but like if you have the possibility, if you're like maintaining the application that is cached as well, then you should really make an effort to fix the application. It's, it's not a good practice to have varnish fix weird behavior of the application behind it. The application should behave properly, send proper cache headers, for example, and varnish should be as simple and as default, as close to the standards as ever possible. But yeah, we had situations where we were asked to put a varnish in front of some weird application that 
nobody really can maintain and whatever. And it was, yeah, well, it's, it's sending you this stuff and you just ignore all the headers. And if it's this path, you cache. And if it's the other path, you don't. And you can do that. It's just not very nice. So Varnish can do a lot. You can do a lot of uh, horrible things in Varnish. Keep your Varnish configuration simple and make your application behave correct first. And make sure that you understand what you're doing and what it means, what's happening. Right, so last bit before the break. Uh, sessions. I just mentioned the cookies before. And with like caching and sessions are really, they, they don't like each other. Because a session means that the server, the application, knows about the user. And caching basically makes sense when you, when you have stateless communication. Because caching expects that if I request this, and then I request it again, somebody else requests it, it, it stays the same. And if, uh, I don't know, if my get bookmarked pages thing changes whenever I add a new bookmark and then I'm in my session so I should get my content, these things don't work well with caching. So first thing is avoiding sessions. If you can avoid them, if you don't need a session, then don't have one. Like Easy Publish is quite happy to start sessions, uh, but if you if you can tell it like okay on on this part of the page, for example, we we don't have a cookie, so don't send it or limit the cookie to a subdomain or whatever, that's helpful. In in some very specific situations, it can make sense to change varnish to still try to cache when there is the session cookie, and then have the application send the very header on the cookie, then you really, really have to make this clean up the cookie thing, because otherwise it's not going to work at all. But if you have only the, the session key in the cookies, and you vary on that, then every user will have their own cache entry, which mainly makes sense in, in the case of edge side includes, which we will get to later, where you have kind of fragments and then one fragment could vary by cookie, that would make sense. And then the, like another option that you have with easy publish is the, is, is caching by some kind of groups where you say actually, well, you have a session, but it's not really your personal session that makes the page different. It's the fact that you're in a specific, uh, I don't know, permission group, for example. You have a specific role on the back end. And that tells, like, the simplest case, maybe a newspaper. And you're like a, a visitor, so you only see the excerpts or a few selected articles. And if you log in, it can check, oh, you're in the role of a paying customer. And then you can see all the articles. Um, so that would be this uh, blob of VCL to, to kind of do the regular expressions to extract all but the PHP session cookie. You, you find that in the documentation. And when you have the cookie cleaned up, this thing would work. So um, how does it work for the, for the user context? The basic idea is this, that you have the request with a session. And the cache needs to figure out what, what is your group. And how it's implemented is Varnish is doing a first request with your session, like with your login, saying, I need the hash for, for this request, for this person. And the web application will handle that and create some hash 
which like typically could be the symphony security groups or it could be some other kind of groups or whatever distinguishes the different classes of user and create something on that. It, it could be a string with a list of all group names or maybe better some MD5 hash or something to keep it to a constant length, but just something and varnish will cache that and this thing should vary on the on the session cookie. So varnish does it once and then it has the hash for this user and then it doesn't need to do it all the time again. And then it does a the, the actual request for the content and adds the hash into the request. So it, it adds that hash and says I now need the content with this hash like for the variant with this hash and the, the application still gets your gets the actual user, it, it acts like normal and the only difference is it, it sends the reply with a this varies on the hash. It doesn't vary on the individual user but it varies on the hash. And that means that once you had somebody of, of a specific group access the content, it's in the cache and the next time somebody else of that group comes it will have the same hash. So the cache hit will see oh this variant with this hash we already have that and we save the request to the backend. Does that make sense? So that's the idea. I think you will show that a uh, bit more in practice later. Yes, basic, basically this is the perfect part to, 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 you know, uh, to show before we go to the easy because basically the entire easy caching system is based on the user context. So mm -hmm. we'll demonstrate it on the <laughs> example. Yeah, so after the break we will see that in, in action. Yes. Okay, I think that's it. Okay, so welcome back everyone. Uh, once again, my name is Hervoy and I will be uh, holding the second part of the workshop, which is, you know, uh, integration of the Varnish and Easy Platform CMS. So basically we'll, we will have to do some prep work before. Uh, so I would ask you kindly to uh, execute this command with sudo, exactly. So since we will be running the, uh, you know, different setup in a separate repository, then we would first have to undo the changes that uh, David made. So please execute this command. And also uh, I noticed that um, after you do that, you will probably have to also run the sudo service Apache 2 restart because uh, um, as I noticed, uh, I will be using Varnish on the default port, the 6081, and uh, if you do not restart Apache afterwards, then uh, it will, you know, the, the Apache configuration will remain on a different port. So please execute this command and then. Sorry. And then this one. And the pseudo password is the same as the username. And after you're done with this part, reposition yourself into the easy HTTP caching project. Sorry. And once inside this folder, uh, please execute the uh, following bash scripts, which is located into in the in the root folder, and it is called prepare.sh. Uh, you don't have to run it with sudo; it basically executes some commands with sudo within it, so it should not be a problem. This script will just, you know, uh, add some files which were missing in the original deploy of the project, which were failed to move to, to, to be moved somewhere, and it will also replace the default VCL file with the easy publish specific one, and uh, you know, just do a couple of restarts, and that should be about it. Do I need to give this on screen still? 
Does anyone need to commence? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, sorry about that. So before you get started, please do a git pull before you run the script. So the git pull will just pull, you know, the, the steps for the exercises and this script which was prepared last night. <laughs> And if everything went well, then you should be able to access the site on the easy HTTP caching .websc domain. It is listed in the in the you know the homepage in both browsers, and this should be working. And this should also be working for you. So the same domain, but on the port six zero eight one. If you can see both the screens, then everything is fine. If it's not let me know, so I'll try to help you. Yeah, it's, it's probably missing configuration in the easy as well, because we need to pin, pinpoint the part for the varnish. OK, so basically, did, did most of you make it by this moment? Do you have the working site? You can access it. You, you, you see the demo contents, this demo installation? OK, um, let me just start. Uh, so basically. I don't think I have to tell anything else about Varnish. I think that would pretty much covered it up. So it is, you know, just a really blazingly fast application which is heavily threaded, which runs in memory, and it will simply be put between the between your web server and the internet, you know, the web. And uh, each time uh, that somebody uh, accesses the website and uh, the web server actually returns the response, it will be cached as a pure HTML in the varnish, and it will speed up the site. So um, basically, we can also skip this as well, I think. Uh, we don't have to explain what the VCL is. Uh, I have prepared some of the links for you if you're more interested in you know, deeper levels of varnish and uh, the exact um, way that the actions are working, that uh, the subroutines run, uh, which keywords and functions you can use. Uh, this presentation is already shared, and it is. Uh, I have added it in the PDF format in the in the repo, so you will find it in the root. It is called is it publish varnish .pdf, something like that. So you can use it if you want to to you know keep better track on the on what's going on. So basically, yeah. You have covered pretty much all of in the VCL, but let's just say that uh, in the VCL you have uh, several subroutines that we will be looking directly in the uh, easy platform specific VCL, and that, uh, as he said, these uh, methods are doing nothing but uh, basically return the current, the next object state, and uh, they do not have variables; they only have the objects which they receive and these objects are you know the uh, backend re request and response the request and response that the varnish is actually returning to the user and the specific uh, variable which is called objects and the object is basically the thing that is uh, you know returned from the in memory cache in varnish so if you have a cached uh, response <laughs> before the actual response is built you will get the object and you are you are able to uh, how should I put it? You're able to, um, you know, uh, exploit that by uh, adding some additional, setting some additional variables in the in the varnish object. You will see in the VCL what I'm talking about. But basically, you can, for example, set the TTL manually on the varnish object, or you can set, for example, grace period, which is basically uh, telling varnish, okay, this uh, this uh, cached response is not actually valid anymore but still keep returning it for a specific amount of time before you refresh the cache, which can be useful sometimes. So basically, we will have a look on how the easy platform specific VCL looks like. Uh, I will make that bigger. Is this good? Okay, so basically, uh, the things that are pretty much uh, easy platform specific are mainly the the purge methods and the user hash methods. Uh, I will just quickly run through the site. So basically, uh, the VCL receive methods will simply, you know, uh, first we 
do a backend hint, as David mentioned. So we're pointing it to Easy Platform. This is in the configuration. And uh, basically what we do is we set some headers which will allow us, for example, this specific header will allow us to, to have the ESI blocks, which is the thing that I will first mention. Um, you know, we, we check uh, for the request URL, we, do, we, we, we set some headers and stuff like that. Uh, then we have the manual, manual subroutine, which is easy specific, which is basically uh, purging the caches by the manual set of rules. We say that we won't cache anything except the get and head requests. We say that um, you know if you have the accept encoding, then you um, uh, set it to gzip or deflate, stuff like that. We do not cache authenticate authorization uh, requests. So uh, basically, that was the thing that I mentioned during the during the break. Um, if you have, for example, like a staging server where you have a full production environment and you have a varnish in front of it, uh, this line will actually make all requests to varnish to actually pass because. Um, when you, for example, have the basic basic out on server, then you will automatically get the authorization header, and it will tell Varnish do not cache that. So basically, if you want to test the real production mode, it is possible to avoid this by simply commenting out this part. You can just comment it out, and then the Varnish will work as it it is actually supposed to work. So that's like a nice hint. And without further ado, okay, so we're doing standard lookup on assets, and stuff like that, but I would like to cover two parts specifically. So, what is this? First thing, X user hash. So David mentioned that uh, by default, the, ease, uh, the varnish has the possibility uh, of, not possibility, but it actually has enabled feature to very uh, it's caches by something called user context. So basically, uh, this is simply uh, additional header which is added to the response from the backend, and uh, it is used for Varnish to, to, to vary it by specific users. In easy context, this is called user hash, but basically this is not user hash because we do not vary the content on each and every user. It is possible to do that, but we'll get back to that. So basically, in easy publish context, we are varying the cache in the context of specific user roles. So basically, if you have the anonymous user role, it has its own set of uh, roles and policies. If you have the uh, specific user group, it will also be aggregated with this. So basically, the easy returns a sort of a hash which is generated from the, the list of all the roles that the current user actually has. Uh, in most setups, you will have the anonymous user, which is basically always the same, but if you modify the, for example, if you add an additional role to the anonymous user or anonymous user group, you will start getting the different, different user context hash. So it basically is not a user hash, but the user group hash or user role hash. So uh, this is important for the VCL because, uh, where is it? This is important. To, to take into account because uh, in the procedure which is called the easy user hash, which we are calling, we are actually trying to get this user hash. And the easy, VCL, uh, easy platform VCL has uh, one peculiarity. Uh, it is actually trying to optimize this process because if you, uh, if you vary by user hash, that means that on each request that you make on the web server, you would have to do additional requests just in order to retrieve the user hash for the current user. And uh, since in Easy Publish, basically all anonymous users are one and the same user, uh, then it will make, uh, and on most of the websites, uh, most of your users are anonymous, unless you know you know, have a specific website with a login and stuff like that. Uh, that would mean, you know, duplicating the requests. Although this request is really small and fast and it shouldn't hit the performance is so hard, but we need to think on a larger scale. I mean, what if we have like a million requests per day or something. So basically what it does is uh, on the first request that the anonymous user makes, it will make, uh, it will make the, uh, the, the, the lookup for the hash. And if it matches the, the anonymous hash after that, which is hard coded in the VCL, then it won't do any more lookups again unless 
of course, you, you uh, move from the anonymous state to the logged in user. So if you log in on a site, obviously your user, cache, user hash will, will change. So this part we can see here, this is actually the official VCL from the GitHub and uh, it has a bug. This, this is actually documented but uh, this anonymous user hash is not correct. In order to get the correct user hash in easy context, we can run a simple command. So we can, uh, we can basically fake the varnish and we can call this route. If you can see this, this is just a simple symphony route with the underscore, so this is internal route. And uh, the thing that is specific here is that we are setting the accept header to the value of application VND force user context hash. So this is basically a, a symphony functionality. We'll just take this route and run it in the context of, the, of our website. This is it. So basically when we do that, we see that we receive actually the response with, with the X user hash value in the response header. So VCL will take this hash and it will, it will simply you know, assign it to the backend response and this user hash will be you know, then propagated and reused for the entire time of uh, the anonymous user hitting the site. And that is one of the easy specific stuff. Uh, I won't go into much details on how it works, but basically, um, basically this is uh, the part where we compare the user hash. If we, uh, if you can see this condition, it says if we have the, we, if we do not have the cookie called easy session ID, and we do not have the authorization on the request, then it means that we're basically dealing with the easy user because the anonymous easy user usually doesn't have the easy session ID until the moment that he actually logs into the site. So, and also here is the part of the code that is pretty much the same as David demonstrated. So basically we are removing all the cookies from the original request and uh, uh, accept the easy session ID, something like that. And uh, Basically, after we receive this, we are restoring the original request URL and doing, you know, the, the lookup. So either a backend fetch or restoring the cached response. So that should cover this. Um, so this is the user hash. The next thing, uh, I also mentioned that we have some tools that we can use. The most common ones that you will be using for debugging anything related to the easy is uh, varnish log and varnish ADM, varnish Adam. Uh, so basically a, C a CLI uh, administration console for the varnish and the varnish log will basically show you uh, exactly what's going on when you make any requests to the varnish. So for example, if I run it, I think on this virtual machine you will have to run it with sudo because it needs some permissions to read the, the secret file or something. If you run the varnish log and you try to make requests to varnish, what? Oh, right. Okay, so if you make a request to the port that varnish is listening, you will actually be able to see which requests he uh, receives with all the headers. You will be able to see what uh, Varnish is calling in the backend. You will be able to see all the headers that the backend response returned. You will be able to see all the headers that are actually added to the final response before being returned back to the user, to the client. So this is one really useful tool and uh, you will be probably utilizing it a lot uh, when it comes to debugging because, you know, when something is not working right, you will simply be able to see if some request is, for example, due to some error if it is returning a uh, very by authorization or a cookie or something like that. Uh, or a private or no cache. Uh, I'm showing this on the Varnish 4 example. We also have the Varnish 3 configuration. Uh, it is a bit different the older version of the Varnish. Varnish 5 is actually completely compatible with this, so no changes whatsoever. So uh, 
if you are curious or you're using the older version of Varnish, you can find it on the on the you know in the repo. You will have the default configuration. It is basically here, Varnish three. It's pretty much the same. Just some some method names, some some routine names, and stuff like that is a bit different, but the basic logic is pretty much the same. Um, okay, so the next thing. I will just, you know, display. I will show how uh, you can create a several, several simple requests to ban, uh, the ba to ban the caches in the varnish. So, for example, uh, you can simply use it like this. Uh, it accepts both regular expressions or, you know, exact matches. So, for example, in the first example, uh, the tilde sign is basically it basically means what comes on the right side is a regular expression. So basically, this would ban all the entries in the uh, varnish where the request host value was actually easy HTTP, containing easy HTTP caching .websc. Uh We can also ban by uh, matching the request URL uh, by default in uh, Symfony, in front of Symfony HTTP cache bundle. Uh, banning by route is actually purge by default, right? So the purge request, I think that it is by default used for banning routes, right? And if you have an exact path, yeah. it's much better to, yeah, it's actually more, the more second performing. example would make more sense to yeah. purge than ban. The difference is ban creates, uh, but basically Varnish keeps a list of things that have been banned. Yep. And whenever you have a request and it yeah. matches something in the cache, it has to compare it against that ban list. Yeah. So it adds an overhead while Perch is telling just like, kill this from the cache drop. right now. Yeah, exactly. The the reason why you would do ban is that you can have regular mat, uh, expressions, you can have like whole sub puffs that you invalidate with a ban, and yes. with Perch it, it needs to be like one specific request. Yeah. So basically similar but not the same, but uh, it not stops you to for from using either one uh, the the first or the latter, but. Uh, what I wanted to say is that also you can use the Varnish admin to uh, send the ban directive directly on the on the cached object. So you can say, I want to ban all the cached objects which contain the X content type identifier header, for example. And you can also do that. So this is directly tempering in, in the in the cached objects, but basically it it pretty much does the same thing. So we'll simply mark it as invalid, and uh, in the next try when you try to access some of these. Uh, you know, if, if you make a request to a route which was previously uh, cached and contained this uh, specific header, then it would simply, you know, return the, the cache is invalid. Go and fetch fetch a new re new response from the backend. Okay, so uh, in context of easy platform, I don't know how how many of you have used the easy published legacy. Did most of you originate as an easy published leg legacy or developer or you are new in the easy, easy platform world. Okay, so basically uh, the varnish is a component that replaces some of the stuff. We can, we can you know, draw a parallel between some systems. For example, in the easy published legacy we had something that was called view cache. And basically the view cache was a file on the file system which would simply, you know, generate the response from the templates uh, from the PHP and uh, the resulting HTML with some variables would be stored in the file and when you wanted to, you know, just when you originally generated this file on the next response, instead of going to the database, instead of compiling the templates again, you would simply pull the view cache file and, uh, you know, process it and return the HTML to the user. Uh, on the other hand, there was also the template block cache which allows us to uh, let's say, cache things separately from the rest of the site. These were also files in the file system, and uh, you could vary them by the parameters which you added in the block templates. And uh, in context of Varnish, we are also able to do that by using something which is called ESI, or Edge Side Includes. Uh, I will get to details with this in the one of the following steps, but first, let's cover the configuration. So in order to make Varnish 
to work with your easy platform installation, you would have to do some, uh, you, would, you will have to set some environment variables. This is basically Symfony related stuff because uh, by default uh, you have the Symfony HTTP cache which is basically a Symfony's variant of proxy, uh, proxy manager which is enabled by default. So in order to utilize Varnish you would first have to disable the, the, the disintegrated HTTP, HTTP proxy. So you are doing this by setting the environment variable Symfony HTTP cache to the value zero. So let's just go to the, to the terminal and let's just do this sudo sites available and our site is easy HTTP caching what ah okay dot conf so basically you will see that uh, we have several variables to set up uh, for the purposes of this workshop uh, first of all we should set the symphony environment variable to dev it looks something like this in the in the default state that you will receive so simply uncomment it and put the value to dev. We'll be doing this just in order to not, not, not have to regenerate the, the, the file system caches every time. So um, if we make changes in the tweak templates or controllers or fetch another you know, resource. The second thing is that we need to uncomment this line and set the value to zero. So by default it will be commented out and it will, uh, it will default it says it will default to disable this Symfony environment is set to dev, but since we might be changing environment at some point to demonstrate some things, then uh, just set this environment to zero and we're good. There is also a third environment variable which is basically not, not important for the varnish to run correctly, and this is Symfony trusted proxies, but basically I think that this configuration is simply used so you would get the correct client address in the x forwarded for or something like that. So this is the internal, the, the internal stuff which is not necessarily required to make the varnish work as the HTTP cache. So this is just convenient. If you, need, if you need to have some functionality which includes uh, detecting the client IP or something like that. So once you're done with this and you restart the Apache service, so sudo service Apache to restart or reload, this configuration should be applied to the site. And uh, as for Symfony, you will, of course, be using the varnish mostly in the production environment. So once you're running Composer install, you can call it with, by directly adding the environment variable in the call like this. So you add the Symfony environment, and you say this is prod or dev environment, and then run Composer install. This will basically propagate the environment variable in the CLI, so all the internal composer scripts will be using this variable to determine if they're supposed to run in the dev or the prod environment. Okay, so. The next thing, we need to configure the EZ itself. So the configuration is pretty basic and pretty simple. We just need to modify the file which is uh, located in the app config and it's called easyplatform.yaml and we have uh, several configurations here. First of all, we have the easy publish HTTP cache configuration where the default value of the purge type is local. We have either a local or HTTP. Uh, if we set this to local, then the, uh, all the requests that are being sent to the server sorry, all the responses that are being sent from the server, uh, will receive no cache private and max stage equals zero. So until you, um, no, sorry, this is just the purge type. So uh, uh, excuse me, if you set this to HTTP, you will simply add uh, the directive, which will tell when you are clearing caches for the content, do a ban request to the backend. So that's pretty much it. This is only enabling the handler which will register, you know, the, 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 the cache clearing operation, either one publish or running the cache, cache uh, clear script or something. 
and it will simply enable and say, okay, no purge the varnish cache. The second configuration is the HTTP cache in the system side group. These are all configurations that can actually be found by default and they're usually commented out. And you have to define the purge server. So the purge server, you have to define which domain we will be using and also if needed on which port this domain will be located. If we go to our project and check the easy platform, dot YAML. We see that this is this is uh, some of these uh, values are actually read from the from the other file, so these are parameterized. So it doesn't uh, you know it's not hard coded, but you can set it to different values in different environments. And I think that default parameters is where we should be looking for. So here it is. So we have basically said, okay, now use uh, the purge component when clearing caches and also set the purge server to the local host to the port 6081 because that is where our varnish is. And the third configuration, which will basically enable the cache, all the caches, is in the content block. It can be uh, configured per site access or per site access group. And basically it means this. If you set the view cache, which is by default false in the dev mode, if you set it to true, then you will basically say, uh, we will be using varnish as the HTTP cache, or we will be using HTTP cache in general. So on all responses, set the public header, so the varnish can know that it can you know, cache these responses. The other thing is the TTL cache, which basically means we will be using the shared maxage header as well for the expiry. And you are also able to set a default shared max age, which is in the default TTL value. So basically this would mean uh, set public on response and set shared max age to one hour or 3,600 3, 3, seconds. And after we were, we're done with this, we should have the, the HTTP cache up and running. Now the edge side includes that I mentioned. These are basically, uh, the edge side include is a, small markup language and uh, it basically will uh, tell to whatever ESI capable processor it has that there are some fragments which are needs to be ran, which need to be ran uh, cont contextually independent from the rest of the page. So uh, the point of that is that you can include parts of other HTML files or other requests in your web page and you can handle them separately. This is especially convenient because such responses that are returned from the ESI, we can actually handle them separately in the cache and we can clear them independently in the cache. So uh, it will basically look like this if you have the ESI, uh, if you have the processor like Varnish which is capable of you know, reading the ESI, it will simply be a HTML tag with the name ESI include and the source to the uh, domain which we are using to load the fragments. So we can see this in the easy publish code if we try to emulate the same thing that the varnish is doing. If you remember from the VCL, uh, somewhere at the point it is checking if uh, it contains a zero gate capability header. And this zero gate capability header is basically set by the EZ. If we are running in the, in the mode or in the port where varnish is, uh, present and we, uh, you know, we, we define it in the configuration then the Symfony controllers will automatically uh, add this um, header and tell Varnish, okay, you have a ESI blocks, so you, you need to process them. If we emulate this behavior, let's see what will happen if we run this curl command on our website. So basically we're just setting the surrogate capability header to the value ABC ESI slash 1.0 and upon return we'll get the HTML but we will see that at some points we're getting the ESI include tags. Now how do we enable it? Uh, in Symfony in general you can use the 
it's an app. In Symfony, you are able to uh, tell the the modes of your controller that you want to run. So, for example, if we check the gallery page or block page, we will see that at some points uh, we are calling the render ASCII controller method, and uh, this render ESI will basically uh, tell the Symfony that if we have this. Uh, Possibility of uh, running the ESI, the, the, the controller as ESI, if we are able to render the ESI blocks, then in that case, you know, it will create this uh, ESI include tag in the in the markup, and uh, you know, it will be processed separately. On the other hand, if we do not have the surrogate capability, then this render ESI will be just ran as a, another subcontroller in the in the uh, in the symphony and uh, its results will be integrated and returned in scope of the entire page view so it won't be cached separately now there are two possibilities of how we can include actually the ESI controllers in the context of easy easy publish if we are using the easy content view action controller and we call it with the render ESI then basically it will take the uh, it will take the Location ID from the from the content that we are currently trying to preview to render, and uh, it will simply add the set public and the max age, and it will mark it, mark this content, the, this response, with the X location ID header. X location ID header is something that Easy is using for tagging all the view responses. Doesn't matter if it's full view, doesn't matter if it is line view or any kind of content view that you want to use. But basically, if you call it with the render ESI, uh, you will simply say, okay, you know, cache this separately, but the X location ID will always be, be there. Uh, which is very convenient because if we are to update some content, for example, I don't know, make a change in the category, which contains some blogs, and we are showing this category with the list of the latest blogs, then upon republishing this content, this block will also get purge from the varnish cache and updated because it is tagged by X location ID and by default when you republish content or do any content changes in EZ, you will actually get the request to purge everything which is tagged with that location ID. So the second way is, uh, it's here. The second way is when we are not using the easy content views, but rather some custom Symfony controller, we can do the same thing. And the thing that we need to know here is that the uh, ESI controllers are basically varied on the parameters they're receiving. And also they give us control on what we want to do with the response object. So I have created, for the example, I did create a custom varnish custom symphony controller, which I am rendering as the ESI. So if you have followed so far, please check out to the exercise one. And once you do this, this is it, okay. So the exercise one branch, I have actually added the ESI controller, a renderer ESI call on the gallery page, gallery page is the project's link here. Okay, so this is it. I have actually just created a custom custom controller where I fetch three latest blog posts and I post them in the context of the rest of the page. So just on top I have added the render ESI. But in this current state, if we try to see terminal reset, if we try to fetch this with the surrogate capability, let's go to the slash projects. So if you go to the page, as is, if you have noticed, I'm going to the port 80 because I want to run the surrogate capability on the port which has no varnish in front of it, because if it has varnish in front of it, then it won't work because varnish is already, you know, <laughs> it will process the surrogate capability and won't get the S includes. So basically, I want to check where my subcontroller is, and I will simply copy the fragment URL, 
and I will render it within the um, okay ah wrong one sorry <laughs> latest blog post this is it slash okay what ah. yeah the, the. okay so this is this is basically my ESI fragment and as I'm running it in the uh, I'm running it in the uh, by direct path on the port which is not varnish applicable but if we check it out you will see that since it's running on port 80, it has a cache control, no cache, and Varnish is just, you know, not aware of it because Varnish is on a different port and we're going directly to the Apache. So, if we wanted to go to the... We will get the forbidden, but at least this functionality can help you to debug your ESI controllers because if something happens, uh, if you make a syntax error or anything in the uh, production mode, for example, uh, you will simply get, you know, the generic error 500, which is returned from Varnish, and you will have absolutely no idea what happened in this subcontroller. So this is the great way of debugging the code and debugging the responses from the, uh, from the ESI block. Uh, second of all, we need to make this response. So basically now, uh, it would not be cached because, by default, if you haven't set, uh, specified differently, all the custom Symfony controller routes are basically set as private by default. So in order to make this work, in order to make this cache in the uh, varnish, we need to go to the parts controller. Now we see we just do a simple search. Uh, we find some locations, we load content, and we return it to the template. So this is uh, private by default. Now if you check the render function, you will see that the third parameter is actually the response. So the thing you can do is actually create a new response object. Which is basically Symfony component HTTP, HTTP, uh, HTTP foundation response. You can create it like this. And then you can manipulate uh, with the response headers because uh, when you render something and you pass the response object, basically the Symfony will process the entire response and it will merge the content and the headers that it is adding with the ones that you have added in your response object. So we can do something like this. We can say we want this response to be set to public. We can also set it to private if we want. We can go with another logic. But with setting it public, we are actually saying, OK, now there is no, no more no cache uh, header. Now it is set to public, and the varnish will store, uh, store the response. You know, It will cache it, and it will return the cached response. We can also do something like uh, setting the, uh, for example, max age. We can set the shared max age. In our context, the shared max age is for example, the thing that we're looking for. So we want to, 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 to store this separate from the rest of the site, which is cached to one hour. But for example, we want this to be cached for the entire day. So we can simply do it by calling the set shared max age method. We can also add the custom headers if we want. And for example, we would like this, uh, this subcontroller to be tagged with the uh, location ID of the block Category because we want when we, when we uh, publish another another blog post in it, we also want this blog to be refreshed and to show you know the latest blogs, so not the old state. So what we can do is we can call the response headers set method, and we can say we want to add the x location ID header. You see that it has a key and values, so the key is x location ID and the value is the Block posts. Ah, 
Ah, blog location ID. Okay. Okay, so after we save it, Sorry. Yeah, also one cool thing that I want to show, uh, in case you want to uh, see your ESI includes, you don't have to use the, uh, you don't have to use the curl because, you know, it's hardly readable in the console. But what you can do is that there are, there are commercial extensions which can help you out and one of them is uh, called Requestly. It's completely free open source and it basically just helps you to to add custom headers on your requests so basically will this work okay obviously not <laughs> we'll just let it load uh, okay so basically once you have done this if you are running your uh, web page uh, on the part port where you have the uh, the varnish. This will now be stored with the public header and it will be rendered with the X location ID and the, um, the, the uh, with set public with the X location ID and with the shared max age of one day. Okay, so this is how you do an ESI. I would like to, how much time do we have? Okay, like 40 minutes. Uh, Just a Question: I think you didn't finish the example because you created the request object, but then you. Oh, do sorry. Right, there. right, right. Of course. So now that you have defined your response object, you simply add it as a third parameter in the response. That's it. Yeah. 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 Just to make sure that. It makes yes. Sense. And. Nope. Uh, so basically, if we do this. Fragment parts, and we call it you should now be able to see that your fragment response actually contains the X location ID and that the cache control is actually public and uh, it has a shared max age set to evaluate it 640 so that that was the thing that we're trying to accomplish okay so next thing Mm. Here. So these are these are all the methods that you can call, or at least some of them, not all of them, but the the ones that matter the most uh, in our case. And uh, the the one that I haven't mentioned is the set vary. So you can also set the vary header that you want. So custom custom vary header uh, on the sub request. The next thing that I would like to show is uh, usually uh, on the real life projects, uh, the X location ID sometimes is not enough. And uh, if we wanted to utilize this uh, varnish cache even more, we could provide some other functionalities. Like, for example, it would be nice if we could just say, okay, we have modified, for example, the article template and we have like 10,000 articles but we also have the heavy duty site which is uh, you know running with the thousands and thousands of requests every minute and we don't just find it convenient to to just you know clear all caches because at that point uh, our web page remains Apache and SQL uh, only and uh, you get just you know 100 requests in seconds and uh, there is a possibility that the entire server will crash so the thing that we can do is actually uh, tag the content with our own headers and what I will try to, to uh, show you today is uh, the way that we can both tag the content by a custom header and how we can programmatically uh, clear the, the, the varnish cache by these custom headers. Uh, basically the easy sets only the X location ID header on every view content response. Now if you remember the configuration I was showing you is easy, easy platform you will see that we have the so-called cache view response listener class which is basically a, a listener that is registered on the you know kernel event when when kernel re returns response this will be called and in the configure cache method you will see that it will simply check if uh, we get we have the view attribute in the request uh, and 
If we do, then we will get the view object and we will check if this is instance of cacheable view. Cacheable view is basically just an interface uh, which will tell us, okay, this can be cached or this cannot be cached. Uh, then we check the configurations, the enable TTL cache, the, uh, the enable view cache. Basically, this stuff is uh, read from the configuration of the YAML, and in this part, it will say, okay, if uh, all the conditions are satisfied, then add the response, uh, tag the response header with the X location ID, and if and set it public, and if the t TTL cache is enabled and it, we have some value on it, then set the share max age as well. So basically, what we can do is we can emulate this behavior by you can go to the git stash and git checkout exercise two. So basically what we do is uh, we will make our own response listener service and we will add some additional tags to the contents. So the thing I did was creating the event listener class which is registered in the services YAML it's located in the app config. I think here, no? Yeah. Yeah, so I have added it in the separate file which is called HTTP cache.yaml just to be easier to find. And so basically uh, we have created uh, a custom cache headers response listener. And in order to make this service work, we will have to um, we need to tag it, and the appropriate tag that you need to use is the actually the kernel dot event subscriber. So, <laughs> so we said kernel dot event subscriber. So we're basically, we have just taken this class from the, from the kernel and we have reproduced this behavior. And we also need to implement the controller, uh, the event listener. So basically, we will simply add the, uh, the new method, which will also be called on the, when the response object is uh, returned from the kernel. And uh, in this, we can basically do pretty much uh, whatever we want the, with the uh, view, but the point is we'll just avoid, for this example, we will simply avoid uh, all the checks that we need because now it doesn't matter. The thing is that we can get the view from the, uh, from the event, so we can do this same thing here. What? Ah, okay. Okay, so we can get the view objects. And we can just say the same as here. We can say uh, get, we can, we can get the view. Uh, we can check if this is cached response view and stuff like that. But the thing that we need is. Uh, basically the response, and once we get the response object from the event, we can do the same thing that we did in the ESI block. So basically we can say response set, uh, response header set. And basically what we're doing here is uh, we are actually, I will just show you here. So basically after registering the service, uh, we can inject whatever we want inside it. So uh, check out exercise to end. To end. Okay. So basically uh, we can get the uh, we can do the same logic here. We can get the response. We can get the uh, actual location from the view. So this is the easy feature. So we get the easy location. And once we get the easy location, we, we can, for example, utilize the, uh, we can, for example, 
utilize the uh, content type service to get the appropriate content type and its identifier and we can for example tag the uh, every uh, cached view response with the with our custom headers so content type id and content type identifier if we check this on the front end so easy okay so if we check it here Okay, I don't know why it takes so long. Probably the container rebuild because we have registered a new service or something. But okay, now that we get the response, we can see that. Uh, ah, of course. We won't see anything because uh, we have already opened the web page and it is cached. So we can just run the app console cache clear, for example. It will work because we have already added a configuration. Okay. So now if we check response we'll see that we have the X content type ID and X content type identifier. Okay, so basically uh, when we're running the custom controller, we can add headers whichever we want, but this is on a global level. So now have we, added, we have added uh, something new in the EZ. And the next step would be, of course, now we have a tagged content, but uh, how are we supposed to clear this content, clear this cache if we want. Uh, I just wanted to mention this. There is uh, one thing in the EZ by default, which is also extendable, and it's called Smart View Cache Clearing. Now, basically, uh, when you republish content in the EZ, for example, then uh, the multiple cache clear requests will be sent in the backend. So the multiple ban requests will be sent. Uh, and uh, not, not multiple ban requests, but one single uh, ban request with the multiple IDs. So basically, uh, the default behavior of the EZ is that it will take the, all the locations from the content we're republishing, and then it will ta also take the parent locations of those locations. It will take their IDs, and also uh, the locations from the related content. This is default behavior. And uh, it will simply send a ban request where it will send a regex for the X location ID, and it will say just uh, ban any object which contains any of these IDs in there x location id header and you can also extend this if you want there are three of them by default so assigned locations parent locations and related locations and if you check these services you will be able to see that basically you can call the method add location to clear uh, on the event and this will basically add the x location id in the you know uh, array of locations we need to clear you can also do something by, by yourself if you want, but it accepts only the location IDs, and that's the downside. So if we wanted to do something with our custom tags, our custom headers, we can utilize the uh, uh, friend of Sim Friends of Symfony uh, cache manager to manually invalidate uh, the HTTP cache by any criteria we want. So there are two actual classes which are interesting to us. The one is the cache manager itself. So if you see the uh, default implementation, you will see that you, for example, have the invalidate path, you have the refresh route, so you have several calls. And this cache manager actually implements the cache invalidator, which is more useful to us because uh, it will contain the routes we will be, uh, the methods we will be using. So the cache invalidator by default uh, contains the methods invalidate or invalidate path, and uh, it will basically recognize the you know it will uh, the symphony itself will recognize if there is a proxy in front of it. Uh, it will make a call with uh, the appropriate command. So if we call the invalidate path by default, it is purge. If we call the invalidate, it is by default ban. We can add uh, the array of headers that we want to send, and it will can just handle it for us. So we will be using this. Okay, we will be using this 
uh, to create our custom cache invalidation. Uh, and if you're following, then please, at this point, we need to switch to the... Uh, you can check out the exercise three branch. So the thing I did here, uh, I had to write a bit more code, but uh, I'm aware that we, we, we won't be able to, to code it in the you know, limited time frame that we have. But we, basically what I did is uh, I implemented my custom uh, cache clear service, which is very basic, very simple. I have simply registered it um, in the HTTP cache. So basically, I have just declared a service uh, which accepts only one argument, and this is the cache manager. So basically, what I'm doing in this service is uh, I have defined two met uh, I have defined two methods which I will be using for invalidating cache. One of them uh, is called invalidate cache for content type. Uh, basically, the possibility that you can do uh, the thing that you can do with the uh, cache manager is uh, that you can uh, set multiple commands, multiple invalidations in a single cache manager instance, and then you can simply do the flush, which will actually you know, execute all these, all, all these bad commands. Uh, and I will be using this, uh, I have de defined this as a service because you know, it makes it convenient. I can use it either in a Symfony command, I can use it in a custom Ajax. So uh, for this uh, workshop purposes, I have created uh, actually a controller, which I will be using to make an AJAX request to purge uh, cache by contents. And as you can see, you know it's just uh, a standard route. It checks if this is the JSON request or not. And I have uh, said that in the request, I will be sending the content type ID as uh, a post parameter, and I will use it to invalidate cache. So. If everything is set up correctly for you, you should be able to have the legacy administration. I have uh, added this uh, repository as the uh, basically easy platform demo installation, but I have also added the easy publish legacy compatibility. If you're interested how to do that, it was basically uh, done by combining two different projects. So uh, one is the fork of the clean installation with easy publish legacy support, and the, the other one was uh, you know, just the you know, easy platform demo. So you can check the, uh, I, I did it in several steps, so you can just check the, uh, the, um, the Git history on the project, and you will see how this was done. So basically, if you log in, uh, I have added, that control, you know, this was just a simple five minutes, uh, simple uh, adding of one link and three lines of JavaScript in the uh, legacy templates, which I extended from the admin. And basically, I have just added the uh, link called class view cache delete. And uh, I have passed the class ID actually as a data parameter, which I'm handling in the in this part of JavaScript, and I'm just doing an AJAX call. I'm not actually interested in the in any results. I just want to, you know, do an AJAX call, and that's it. And it will return success or failure, and that's about it. So uh, I'm also using the uh, Symfony URL method, which is uh, from the extension called NG Symfony Tools, and it allow basically allows you to call the uh, Symfony routes or uh, Symfony controllers or even re render twig uh, templates within the context of Easy Publish Legacy. So it's quite useful. Okay, so basically, uh, if we skip to the end part, we will see that um, in HTTP cache, clear service. The only thing that we need to actually do uh, to invalidate the cache is just call the cache manager, invoke the cache manager, and call the invalidate route, invalidate method. And invalidate method actually receives the array of headers. So we can define what, whichever custom header we want here and just invoke it, and uh, this will purge the HTTP cache for us. The other thing that we need is the commit methods 
which, as I mentioned, uh, it will just call the flush method on the cache manager, and uh, it will basically take all the, you know, uh, all the all the uh, requests that we defined with invalidate invokes, and it will simply execute them, you know, send them to the, the varnish and uh, complete the process. And if I may, uh, just why the flush even exists, the point is that you might have like several invalidations yep. that you encounter, and with this flush system, the cache manager thing can just do like multi-curl requests in parallel. And yes. if you have several servers with varnish, and you need to tell each of them to invalidate. So the other yep. thing is that flush should best be called in the kernel terminate event, which is after the response has been sent. Yes. Because otherwise, if you if your admin request is doing the cache invalidation, is triggering that, mm -hmm. your users, like the admin user, would have to wait for his page until the invalidation happened. Yes. So that's why flush is separate and it's not sent immediately. Yeah. And so for uh, invalidation of, by x content type ID, uh, we can show how simple this is. So basically, you just need to invoke the cache clear service. You need to pass the content type ID to invalidate cache for content type, and then just invo invoke the commit method, which will do a flush. And that's about it. So basically, if we wanted to clear all the caches for the, uh, for the home page, bad example, but for example, if we wanted to, to, to clear all the caches for the blog posts, for example, we can simply go to one single blog post. Let's show it here. Um, easy HTTP caching. So if we go to, I don't know the route by heart, but stop stories and um, we open this blog, for example. We can see that right now, uh, this is stored in the varnish. I have reloaded it for two times. So, one more time. <laughs> okay, so we can see that we have a hit. We can see the two numbers in the X varnish. This is also good to know. Uh, if you do not, if you are not in the debuggers list, you won't be able to actually see the X cache debug and X cache. Uh, headers, they will be removed from the response body. So uh, in case you're not in validator, you will still, ha still have the X varnish uh, header. And basically, if you see only one number in it, then it means it was a miss. If you see two numbers, it was a hit. It's a rule of thumb and very practical on production sites. Okay, so, uh, so you can see that we have a hit here. This is stored for one hour. The regular stuff that we, uh, you know, defined in a configuration, and so five things to consider. Let's open, doesn't matter if we open that one or any one, because we can always click on any blog post and say delete class view cache. That's it, I just did an alert. And now if we go back, we should be, to, we should be able to see that in this case, it was actually a miss. Nope. Hmm. Hold on a sec. Hmm. Okay. Perhaps I'm missing a tag or something. Let me just run the. It's not like I tested it for a hundred times before the workshop. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. So this one should be a miss right now. Yes, if we reload it, it should be a hit. Okay, so it's a hit. Let's reload this as well, just to be sure. And delete class view cache. Okay. OK, 
okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is weird. Okay, so my presentation failed. But uh, anyways, uh, I don't know what uh, the current situation is. Probably some cash or some. Let me just check if we have. Now it's exercise four. Okay, this is the last one, but uh, it should be work with exercise three. And. Let me just try one more time. We have 15 minutes left. Okay, so the content type was actually called. So now we're here. And it returns, it sent the 18, it returned 200, okay. Okay. Let me see one more time. Okay, so a miss. Ah, this is the administration one. Ah, of course, I forgot the, the most important part. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, we, we now are able to send the band request with the custom, uh, custom header. But how is Varnish going to know that he needs to handle it? <laughs> so basically at this point, we're sending it, but we need to handle it in the VCL in order to tell Varnish how to handle this. So uh, let's go to the varnish defaults so now we go to the easy purge method and as we can see uh, basically the code is pretty simple uh, in the default state the easy will simply check uh, if the uh, if the method is banned it has this logic where uh, it prohibits uh, the, all the IP addresses which are not marked as uh, invalidators to be able to do a ban for security reasons and stuff. And we also check if the request for ban contains X location ID, then we'll simply call a ban method with the object HTTP X location ID. So this is the uh, actually the varnish cached object. And we'll say ban all the objects which uh, have the X location ID header tilde, so this is basically regex, with the X location ID which was sent in the header. So if you send only a number, it will work. It, if you set the regex with the beginning and the end and the piping different location IDs, it will, it will ban all the entries with, tagged with those location IDs. So basically we can take, and of course at the end it will just return the synth command, so it's just, you know, the res simple response which says this was banned. Uh, what we can do here, Oh, sorry, we need a sudo. What we can do here is simply reproduce this by saying if request HTTP, so if the request contains X content type ID, then, sorry, switching to the correct layout. <laughs> uh, so if the request contains this, we can also call, we can basically copy paste this uh, control shift C so we can say ban all the requests with tag with the X content type ID and we don't even have to um, we can we can also use the regex, but it doesn't really matter. I mean, uh, we can nothing stops us to, to to tag the content with, for example, multiple content type IDs separated with space or something like that. So the regex is convenient in this case, and we'll simply do this. And if we have done this correctly, we'll simply do the same thing and return returns in bands. Now, the biggest problem with the varnish is that 
you know, this won't be applied until you restart the service. And once you restart the service, you basically clear out the entire varnish cache. So uh, when doing this on production, uh, on production mode, on production server, just have this in mind. It may be not, not be a good idea, you know, to run it in the, in the peak of the load or something. <laughs> Ah, right, right, right. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, you can, you can do the VCL load, right? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this. Yeah. It can have some side effects, but you should know what changes you apply, but for some changes you can do. Yeah. Okay, so basically, now we have applied the... Thank you for this. Uh, basically, we have applied the new configuration. We have restarted the varnish. We see that this is a miss. Now it should be a hit again. Yes, it is. OK, so basically now we will finally go to the administration, run the class view cache, OK. And after the reload, after the reload, we have a miss. Yeah, so basically we made it. Uh, you can do all sorts of uh, sorts of things in the same fashion. Uh, for example, uh, you can add as, as many uh, provisional headers that you want uh, to optimize your caches. Uh, one of the things that I will also mention before the end is the X host, which can be natively used. You know, by uh, Varnish, Varnish sets this host uh, this uh, header to all the re responses anyway, and you can exploit it to you know have the better better scope of your cache clearing. But I wanted to just to mention one more thing, which is more of a tip for you. Basically, uh, if you are using the legacy admin still, uh, you can also make use of the legacy smart view cache configuration. Because uh, if you have the legacy administration, it is, uh, you know, the old cache manager is hooked to the, to the Varnish cache manager. So once you clear the view cache or republish the content or something like that, in the legacy administration, it will, you know, uh, also invalidate the HTTP cache. So what the thing that you can do here is basically set the view cache any configuration that you were using on your legacy site. And you can say, if I republish this object, I also want all the children and all the, the entire parent subtree and also some related classes uh, to be purged as well. And basically, if you go with the, with the varnish log, let me just show you. I'll try to be as quick as possible. Uh, I don't know if there is anything but git checkout exercise four. Uh, I will simply copy the prepared view cache in open PHP to easy publish legacy settings override folder. Clear the legacy caches. Okay. So uh, if we add a configuration in the legacy, which says, uh, OK, I have added for the blog posts, legacy settings overwrites, view cache. For example, we can say uh, with the legacy configuration, we can say, OK, for the blog post, the dependent classes are blog, blog post, and home page. And please, when you republish this object, also clear not just the object cache, but for the parent, for its siblings, and all the relating objects. Basically, the similar thing as in the new stack, but uh, on, in, in, in using the legacy admin, you don't have to implement anything. You can simply use it out of the box. You can see that, uh, I know, for varnish log, if we go in the administration and we republish this blog post, send for publishing, OK, so we got something. You will see that we have actually made a ban request, which contains uh, several location IDs in the request header. Uh, if you if we didn't have the view cache any 
at this point, we would only have the blog post location, the blog location, and th that would be it. So we would have only two values there because by default, the new stack handles only all the locations of the current content, all its parent locations and related content. So as you can see, you, you can utilize this. Uh, the things that I also want to mention before the end, just two more things. So for the multi-site setups, uh, you can, uh, uh, I don't know how many of you had the situation where the, uh, you had a server with the several installations of the easy publish or for example, just one huge installation which uh, with, uh, you know, a uh, huge number of domains with separate uh, SQL databases and stuff like that. If, uh, for example, uh, if you have two sites on which one site is on really, really heavy load and the other site which is just, you know, some small uh, campaign site or something and you want to make a change on a campaign site, if you run the cache clear, you will clear all caches, all varnish caches everywhere because by default, when you do a cache clear, uh, easy publish will send the purge request with the X host asterisk and X location ID asterisk. Uh, the same thing if you use the administration to purge caches, it will also send the X location ID in the ban request, but it will set the X host on asterisk. So basically, uh, if you have multiple installations with the same location IDs on different sites, you will basically clear uh, the cache is on all domains on the server because there is usually only one instance of varnish. This is changed in the varnish 5. You can add different uh, VCLs for different uh, domains, so for different uh, request matches. So uh, that is, is this uh, things up a bit. But if you wanted to manipulate this, you can, for example, simply override the default uh, for Spurge client, this is actually the uh, this is the, actually the PHP class which is located in the uh, is the publish kernel, oh, sorry, this is actually located in the easy publish kernel and uh, by default it only has two methods, the purge and the purge all and as you can see it sends only the X location ID host but what you can do to utilize this is for example you can set some configuration which will tell you okay this domain and this domain and this domain these are the part of this site you can add it in the configuration and then, for example, if you're running the cache clear command, you can run it in a site access aware environment and you can add this, you know, uh, the, uh, these uh, configurations per site access. So when you run it, it will call the purge all, but you can, for example, say, okay, if I have the uh, hosts array, just take this host array and in the invalidate array, add the X host header. So you can also do this as well. And by doing that, you will uh, prevent the uh, cache clear command from you know, just destroying all cache that you have on the server for like 10 sites. This is especially useful if you have like uh, a staging server where you want to, to test varnish, for example, and you have like 50 different sites on it, different installations of EZ, this can be very convenient. And for the end, I just want to mention that uh, everything that we did here applies to the EZ platform. Of course, uh, there is also uh, a new solution that is being prepared. I don't really know when it will be, uh, you know, actually used in, uh, on actual production sites and it, when it will be production ready. But uh, it is called the Easy Platform HTTP Cache. This is the new project uh, which uh, basically utilizes the XKey uh, module for uh, Varnish, and it the XKey actually. Uh, allows you to add secondary hashtags, hash headers to the uh, requests. Basically, they are called X key and you can have multiple values in it. So uh, in the future, this will be used for manual tagging of the content and you will probably be able also to add your own custom X keys through some interface on your, on your response objects. And uh, you will be able to, to specify which, uh, which of these X keys, X key headers you want to use when you are banning the content. So for example, the thing that we showed, uh, you will probably be able to tag the content with the content, with all its location IDs, with a content type identifier, and you will be able to trigger some of the cache clearing from the administration interface, probably in the hybrid UI, I hope. <laughs> But you know, if not, uh, it shouldn't be a problem to implement it customly and uh, integrate it in the in the new uh, administration interface. And that pretty much covers everything. Any questions? Okay. Sorry. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, yes. Actually, actually, that calls the uh, where was it on the slide before? Um, cache invalidator. Ah, the legacy. Okay. Uh, basically, it calls the uh, this. Do I have it open still? Sorry. Switching between Linux and Mac really <laughs> is inconvenient for me. Uh, okay. So basically, when you call the cache clear command, it will just invoke the purge all methods. And it's, if you can see, the purge all method actually sends the invalidate with X location ID asterisk. So clear just everything everywhere. <laughs> so basically, if you wanted to utilize the X host, you would add it here. And then you would go to varnish, and in the VCL, in the easy purge method, you would also add the criterion if the X host, if we receive the X host and the location ID, then invalidate using these two conditions with the and and, you know, and this way you could drill it down to a specific domain. Yes. Yes, and that is the exact thing that would be so much, so useful here, but in the new easy platform, uh, you do not have the installation ID anymore. Installation, uh, installation ID was used uh, both for uh, solar instances and for the view cache clearing and a lot of stuff, but this thing actually doesn't exist anymore, but you can add it. You can just add the Symfony configuration with a random hash and use it, you know, for everything. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So you can either go with your, for example, custom service and a comment for, for complex clearing of the caches with custom headers, or you can try to override this one. So the basic, basic uh, easy for purge client, you can override it, you can add additional uh, things from the configuration, you can um, inject additional services and use them here. But basically, you know, you, you will always get just the location IDs from the cache clear command, and then you would have to drill down the specific part that you want to, to, to affect with it. So you would have to do, do this uh, manually here or just write your own command. Uh -huh. Okay. Yes. It highly depends on the case. Uh, if you have like a smaller site with uh, some content which is displayed for like 100 users, for example, the smaller amount of registered users, then yes, I would definitely agree that it makes sense to vary it by users. And varying by users, it is actually possible to enable just by, by setting the uh, response listener. It already exists. I think it is even possible to do it to, uh, through the configuration, which basically just sets the very header cookie. It adds it along with other very headers, and then you will get the user, uh, the actual user context. But for example, if you have a site like some forum or something where you have 10,000 users, you know, it, at one point you would get, uh, you would uh, lose all the benefits from Varnish because if it has to vary every request for every user there, it will just grow incremental in size, take all your RAM, and you wouldn't have any benefit from it. The whole point is that uh, you try to granulate these uh, uh, cache entries to, to have most of the site in some general form which is visible for everyone, and then only the user-specific parts can be either rendered by varying or by ESI blocks, or simply set as private and just fetch from the, from the web server. Yeah. yeah. Maybe a general note on, on that point. There is like all these things you can do with Varnish, but uh, if you use caching because your backend is like on its own just too slow, it's not really, it's like a dangerous approach. It's, it's just a band-aid, not a real fix. Yeah. Like caching is the solution to scaling. So if you have like a lot of requests and you have a lot of users requesting the same thing, then caching really is like the proper tool. But if you just have a, an application that is really slow because I don't know, it's doing too many database requests, it's too complicated, then you should also look at the application and try to see if you can fix the application itself so it's faster in responding. Try to see if you can maybe use caches inside the application for some of the 
you realize like every request always does this database request and it's a slow query, mm -hmm. maybe you can cache something in a Redis or something like that. Yeah, just use to, the persistence cache. To speed cache up the site itself. Yeah. Because the application itself, like the faster it is, the, the better the whole thing will work. And caching yep. is mainly, like the main benefit is if you have a lot of people requesting the same thing. But yep. yeah, with, with this site with like different users or also a site with like lots and lots of content, you will always have cache misses. And if every cache miss is like 10 seconds load time, yep. then you can have as many caches as you want, but it's still not great. So yep. there is that. Yep. Okay, no more questions. Uh, if you have any more questions, you can meet me right after this workshop and uh, we can talk about everything. Thank you, David. Thank you all.